Hi everyone, uh, my name is Yvonne. I am an engineer on the Polymer team. Uh, I've been mainly working on Polymer elements for the last year and a half or so. And I'm going to talk about how we do communication and message passing in Polymer. So by message passing, I mean how we get Polymer elements to talk to each other and also how Polymer elements talk to the world outside. Um, so I think both Taylor and Guido talked about what Polymer elements are and they're just regular DOM elements. So that means we don't have to invent a new way for them to communicate and we can use things that are um, in HTML DOM. So the main way we use to communicate between elements is HTML um, custom events. And so when an element wants to send something up to tree, then it would fire a custom event. And we also talked about how Polymer is a sugaring library. Um, so we have a function called list.fire. Basically, it calls a new custom event and dispatch event for you. So you can really easily fire a custom event for whatever um, whatever thing you want to notify other elements of. So comes with three arguments. So first is your event type. The second argument is optional. It's an object it can be anything that you want to pass um, to other elements. And the third one is some options that you get to pass to the event. So whether it's a bubbling event or if it's a cancelable event and what node you want to fire it on. So most of the time, you probably just want to fire the event, so you would just need to call the stop fire with the event name. And on the receiver side, you can call add event listener with the event that you're interested in, but like everything else in Polymer, we want to sugar that to make it a little bit easier for you guys. So in the Polymer uh, prototype, there's a special property called listeners, where you can declare a map of event name, actually it's the event name prefixed with on dash, to a string that uh, matches the method name of your event handler, which is defined in your prototype also. So here's an example of an element that I want to listen to the send hello event from its local DOM. Um, so you say listeners on dash set hello, and your, the name of the method that you want to get called when the set hello event is fired by anything that's down the tree from it. Um, and the arguments you get is the event object, the detail, which is the detail that got sent uh, when you call this a fire, and the sender of the event. Because since it's a bubbling event, um, it's not necessarily this element that sends the event, and it could be something further down the tree. And just like regular events, you can like stop it, and you can stop it from propagating if you don't want the outside world to know and then do all the regular stuff. Um, if the event is not bubbling, or you want to listen to the event specifically on a particular element, um, we have a declarative way for you to attach an event handler, and that is in this, in the element that you want to attach the event listener on, um, you can add an attribute of the event name, prefix with on dash, and the value would be this method name, just like before. And that would declaratively set up your event listener. Um, so we process these attributes uh, from the parent element. So the attribute does not have to be on a Polymer element. So in this case, it would also work with native HTML elements. So like on input, you can listen to an input event with the same syntax. So we fire events when a child element wants to tell something up the tree. So what do you do when you want something down the tree? Then we would call methods on your child node or set properties on it. Um, so something we don't like to do in Polymer is to reach into your children's local DOM. So by local DOM, I mean 
the template that your Polymer element declares. So we consider that private API to the element, as opposed to something like, in a select tag, the user provides you with the options that goes to the select, and we consider that external API. So what you don't want to do, um, oh, and also this dot dollar is the Polymer feature that lets you access um, nodes in your in your local DOM by the ID. So this dot dollar child would be a reference to a node with the ID child in your local DOM. Um, okay, so what you don't want to do is you don't want to reach into your children and then reach into their children and to do stuff with them. Um, and the second thing you don't want to do is say, I want to tell one of my sibling knows something. You don't want to um, reach through your parent and then have and then get to your sibling directly by messing around with your parents, um, but messing around with your parents' local. Level. And that's because you don't want to break the encapsulation of your element. You you are not supposed to know how other elements are implemented, and in the case of your siblings, you have no knowledge. So I'm an element, I have no knowledge of how the user is using it, and I cannot assume anything about how the tree, um, how the, what the tree looks like outside of where I am. So as an application developer, you can say that, hey, I know about how all my trees are, but I think architecturally, it, it usually makes for a cleaner element that's uh, more reusable and better architected if you try to just have, know that I have no knowledge about the world outside. Um, so how, what do we do if we sometimes need uh, elements that are not, that don't have a direct parent-child relationship to interact with each other? So we like to use something we call the mediator pattern. So I saw a slide from Kevin's talk yesterday. Um, so the basic idea is Instead of having child one and child two talk directly with each other, we would go through the parent and then have the parent mediate the interaction between the two of them. Um, so for more details on this, watch Kevin's talk. He goes into great detail about how it works and how we apply it in elements that we built. Okay, so another method that we use to um, do IPC between elements is data binding. So for us, data binding, we, is, we didn't implement it in a magical way. We, we use it as a shortcut to set properties, and we use it um, when child nodes want to notify changes to his parents. So normally, if you want to set a property, on a child, then you would do it. You could do it like this. So we have uh, your child here with the ID high, and you want to set their property time set to my property of with the same name. So you would do that um, imperatively. But with in Polymer, we have a declarative way to do the same thing. Um, you can say, "Hey, I want to set my child's time set." attribute and then square brackets with my property. So that means every time we change our property names time set, it would uh, also set your child's property. So this and the previous is equivalent. And the square bracket means we want our data changes to propagate downwards. Um, so the way this is implemented in Polymer is we override the setter in the Polymer element. So every time the property is set, uh, we go through all the bindings to this property and set the value of it with the updated value. So not magical, just something that we already can do with JavaScript. Um, so for upwards, when a child wants to propagate its value to parents, um, we also use data mining. So the way we make it work in Polymer is that um, in a prototype, we have another special property named properties, which is, uh, which is where we declare all the properties 
that we want to give special powers to. So one of these things is notify true. So when we set notify true, what it does is when the property changes, the element will fire an event. So someone else could be listening to it and find out about um, when this property receives a new value. So in the parent, the parent would use curly braces to indicate that it's interested in participating in this two-way binding. So in this case, if the say hello function updates the times set attribute, then it would get propagated to um, this element's own property. And also, when you do curly, it means two ways, so you would get upwards and downwards binding. Um, so, so I said that you need cooperation to make two-way binding work. Um, so what I mean is if your parent uses curly but the element does not have notified true on this property, then you would not get two-way binding. You need both sides to agree that, hey, I want to participate in this. Um, so I mentioned that it actually fires an event when the property changes. So another way that you might want, you might be able to um, get notified of your child's data changes is by listening to this event. And the event name is your property um, with dash case instead of camel case and suffix with changed. So you can listen to this and do something um, that, you know, other, if you want to do something other than setting the property. Um, so this event is actually really useful for us um, because in this case we know that we want to listen to a data change on a node that we already know about. But in Shadow DOM we also have reprojection where you can have children that are supplied by the user. Um, and maybe I want to do something with these elements that are supplied by a user but I have no idea what they are because they're not in my template, so I cannot reference them. And also they can be dynamically attached and detached by a user. So there's a pattern that I've been using that seems that has been pretty useful. So say you have something like this, where these two these two elements are projected into your um, insertion form. So in each of the children, uh, we have a callback attached, which is a custom elements callback that gets called when this node is inserted into the DOM. Um, so I would fire an event to notify that, hey, I'm here, I'm attached to the DOM. And on the parent side, I will listen to the same event and keep track of all the nodes that has appeared. So now I have a list of all the nodes that has um, has attached to me that is not my local DOM. And later on, I would be able to do stuff with them. And also, so I do an attach, that's all a detached callback, which you can listen to to find out when you're removed from a tree. So the parent would also listen to the detached event and remove it from the array of whatever it is that needs to do. Okay, so, oh, and actually I think this is such a common thing for us in our Polymer elements that I think the Polymer core team is gonna add something to support this, but it's not, it's in progress, so for now, this is a useful one. And another kind of binding we have is you can bind to the sub-properties of an object. So here we have uh, the object greetings and it has more stuff in it. And you can bind directly to hello world here by using the regular object syntax. Um, so we call that path binding. So because we override the setter to uh, propagate data values, if you override a sub-property of an object, then we would not know about it. So you would have to manually notify by calling this dot notify path with the new value. And you know, since usually we want to set and notify and we're lazy and we want to make things easy, 
We also have function call set, which was set and notify. So here you would, that would be equivalent to having notify true on a property. And that also implies that when you do this, um, your, you will get two-way binding by default. That's kind of not, the idea of having a one-way binding on a path binding kind of is, doesn't make sense in, in our implementation. Um, you can bind to some properties of an array item um, with the array item dot index dot some property syntax. Um, so this syntax doesn't work. And also, right now, you cannot bind directly to an array item. <coughs> Limitation. So what happens if you change the array? If you remove it or you, you, you give it? Uh, if you totally, if you change the array, then the array center it would know that it's different and rerun the binding. So if you change this object that it is that it actually knows that it's actually watching for changes on, then mm -hmm. you then you would be able to get the new value. Okay, but if I if I bind but this if you, second element and I insert at the zeroth position five new elements to what? field is it then bound? Is it to the new second element or to the seventh element? Uh, in, if you change the comp, if you insert, if you change the array, it does not know by default. So we have something called an array observer to do this, um, which I did not go into in this talk. But there's a way, but you have to do something additional if you want to uh, get changes in your array. Yeah. So by default, it's just pretty simple. Okay, so I mentioned that when we do an upwards data binding, the way it works for us is we're listening to this custom event um, and then updating the value when we get this event. So our normal syntax for doing an upwards data binding is actually just a shortcut for this syntax. So the colon colon, the full syntax is um, property that I want to update for the event I want to listen on. So that means you can actually update the value on a different event. So if you if you know that when my child fires said hello, it updates this, I want it to update this property, then you can just put a different event there. So another kind of binding we have is um, attribute binding. Um, this is useful if you want to bind to native HTML properties. What it does is when it sets the value in your child, instead of doing a you know, property equals new value, it's a set attribute. So mainly useful on native elements. Okay, so for, okay, so we have custom events, calling methods, setting properties, and data binding, and we use the mediator pattern when you have child nodes that want to talk to each other. Okay, so I have one more thing that I want to mention that's not really related, but I got some questions about this yesterday. The question is, um, in the case of I have, a, in my app, I have a single data source, but I have a whole bunch of different elements that want to use the same data source. Um, how do we do that in Polymer? So, one way is you can make a singleton element that encapsulates uh, a singleton instance of something. So this, the singleton gets created once for all instances of singleton element that you create. So once you make this in everywhere you want to reference the singleton, you can create a new singleton element and they would all talk to the same object. All right, so, and that's it for me. So thanks for coming to, thanks for coming to this talk and also thanks Paul for inviting us. Uh, it's been a great honor and Amsterdam was wonderful. So I'm on Twitter and GitHub. So, thank you. Yes. Um, so, so maybe, maybe not completely related, but um, do you do um, optional bindings? Um, uh, as, what do you mean by optional bindings? Uh, in attributes, um, when, when, a, when a component uh, has attributes that, that you use, um, 
Uh, is there a way to uh, specify uh, which ones are optional? Or, or is it just forgiving uh, in which attributes you, you supply? And for example, the Google map, uh, where you just give a lap long uh, yeah. and no zoom, uh, how does that work? Are, are, the, are the attributes by default optional? Uh, or do you have to supply uh, a configuration? Uh, do, do you mean like for no zoom, it's either there or yeah, not there yeah, and it doesn't yeah. have a value? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we have a way to do, so no, in the properties, uh, properties, property, in the properties, property, yeah. um, so part of the special bag of options you can give it is a type, so it knows that if the type is Boolean, then you want an attribute that is true when it's present and false when it's not present. You can also uh, supply a default value to any property. Yeah, and then you, uh, you can also supply a default value to a property. Yeah, that's what you have. Uh, so with a combination of type and the default value, then you would yeah. go get what you want. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. Could you go one step back, please? To the thing that uh, you showed earlier. So uh, I, I'm not sure if this uh, is intended to be, but if you uh, include some behaviors, uh, then you get real private uh, uh, methods. Uh, yeah, this, um, between those, uh, yeah, different behaviors. So what you can do is you can have the same function name, for example, and call it from different behaviors from inside, which is living inside the same element. Yeah, and they're totally isolated, which is great in my opinion. Oh yeah. So you get oh, two, yeah, totally. two private, so like, private states there. Yeah, so here you can also define more private and then have your singleton call it. Uh, yeah, what, what the question was is uh, that if you have a behavior uh, inside and include more other polymer elements, all of them are isolated themselves. So uh, I think this is a great opportunity to do real isolation and do real private functions within a polymer element. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Regarding the media agent matter, yes. if you have got some internal yeah, state, like, I don't know, one component uh, gives you a certain uh, object uh, as a yeah, um, output, input, and you yep. pass that along into another component. Yep. And apparently, from what I um, heard yesterday, you should add this variable, let's call it, I don't know, items, into these properties, uh, property, don't, don't you? Um, I do not, I do not, I think, so this is a case where you have a child that wants to pass its value to some other child. Yeah, exactly. Um, like you, you've got one element and two child elements and yeah. you receive something from the first child and has it yeah. into the second. So, so, so we do have an element like this, um, for instance, we have a paper menu button. Yeah. And paper menu button essentially lets you have kind of a select style mm -hmm. control by pairing a, an input and a, a menu of options that you can select from. And so what essentially happens is the pairing element uh, receives events from the list, like an item was selected, and then uses the information from that event to assign a property on the input to set the display value of the input. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so uh, my question was regarding the, pro uh, the properties. Property. Yeah. Um, do I have to declare such an internal um, variable in there? Uh, I, I don't, I don't think so. So you, well, I guess it depends on you. Depend on you. So your parent, if you want to to pass a value from a child to another child, mm -hmm. so what you do is you bind the value from one child to yourself. So mm -hmm. your parent, yes, your parent would have a new property that is bound to the value that you're interested in, yeah. in your child. And then this property would be bound to the mm -hmm. other child that you want to pass the value to. Exactly. So, uh, so at the moment, I don't have to put it into this properties uh, thing. It works I mean, uh, like this. So, I to, so I think you, you don't have to unless you want special features that the properties bag gives you. Exactly, for instance, yeah. um, observers? Or yeah, so yeah. for example, observers, or mm -hmm. if it itself is notify, or if it, mm -hmm. you want a type, yeah. or if you want to exactly. reflect to the attribute, or yeah. so any of the my, my, my question is uh, targeting the thing. Uh, if I put it into the properties um, property, it gets part of the public API of the other adjustment, but it's actually only an internal thing. Yeah, so we have a convention where we use read prefix with underscore. 
Okay, and so well, if, mm -hmm. um, just a convention because yeah. there's no true, okay. not really true private state, but okay, if you through. have underscore, then we consider it private. Eventually the language will evolve to the point where we can yeah. this, we won't Eventually we'll have it private. private. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much.